Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our room. And now you're all coming over from the, uh, the bigger room, walking down the hall, so to speak. And thanks for your patience today. Thought as we get started, we would just love to see your, um, and Paul put a question in the chat box. Um, we'd love to hear your, see your name, your location, and how many of these conferences you've attended. We know this is your first Learning Forward virtual conference, but I see many familiar faces. I know you've been with us in other places than this, this Zoom universe that we're all inhabiting right now. Lots of experienced conference goers. And I think we'll give folks just a couple more minute or so to get, get in the room. We know we had kind of a short transition time um, from the keynote. Great to see newbies in the room too. And people who uh, came to more than 10, it's hard to count at this point, isn't it? So, so honored you continue to connect with us and the, the value you bring to this is fantastic. So we are, we will start out with uh, cameras on. If, if you're in a position where you wanna have your camera on this morning, that would be great. Great to see your faces. Um, and we'll engage in the chat box throughout our, our two hours today. Um, and when we get to the uh, panel presentation part, we'll feature our panelists and turn our cameras off if we're not the, the uh, panelists or the moderator. So thanks so much, great to see you. I think we can, I think we can get started. All right. Denise, kick us off. All right. Well, I tell you, it's so wonderful to have you all here. Um, the Standards Professional Learning Revision Lab uh, focused on transformation today. And welcome to everyone from all time zones. I know we have many people here uh, from many time zones. And I'm Denise Glenn Borders, President and CEO of Learning Forward. And I'd like to first introduce the, my three other members of our Learning Forward Standards team. Tracy Crow, who was just speaking, is our Chief of Strategy and Communications. Paul Fleming, give a wave, Paul, is our Senior Vice President of Standards, States, and Equity. And Elizabeth Foster is our Vice President of Research and Standards. Wave, Elizabeth. And so our standards of focus uh, for this session is transformation. And our four incredible panelists, uh, we are so happy to introduce our uh, first, um, Anthony, better known as Tony McKay, CEO of uh, the National Center on Education and the Economy. We have Jackie Wilson, give a wave out, Executive Director of National Policy Board for Education Administration, Leilani Esmon, Des uh, Director of Staff Development, Gwinnett County Public Schools, and Stephanie Hirsch, former Executive Director of Learning Forward. As I said, our standards focus for this session is um, transformation and before um, I get started, um, we get started with the entire session. I just want to tell you how excited we are to have the prestigious panelists we have to share their insights today uh, and how excited we are to share the very first round of the Learning Forward revised draft standards. They are all out there. 
now for you to review and see. We have them on the website and we have them in several places, which we'll talk about um, later for you to access and of course, give us great feedback. We've received such valuable input and guidance um, from our standards advisory committee, which you'll learn a little bit more about. Um, our Learning Forward board, affiliates, foundation and staff. And first, I just wanna take a bit of time uh, for a few reflections about our journey thus far in developing the new standards and how we got to this point. Uh, the Learning Forward Standards team, we've all been meeting weekly, actually, sometimes several times per week since the beginning of the year, uh, steeped in all the guidance uh, from the four meetings of the uh, Standards Advisory Council thus far and all the other stakeholders that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we've learned so much um, through our support of districts, how challenging the back to school starts have been in the pandemic environment and what educators most urgent needs are and what new skills that they really need to learn. Uh, through our weekly webinars, teachers and leaders have really reinforced how important it is now more than ever to ground education in the highest quality professional learning and practice no matter the delivery virtual or face-to-face. -face. Uh, we've actually immersed ourselves in research on myriad industry and professional standards, both in the US and globally, to ensure that we have an international perspective for all of those that are um, implementing the standards across the globe. We've been very intentional about equity being threaded throughout the standards, which, which with much greater emphasis and we've been clear that the standards uh, should be structured as aspirational, directional, and actionable. And we've added essential actions, exemplars, and vignettes. We were focused on coherence as well and committed to multiple iterations uh, and considerations. So we really look forward to digging in today in our specific area of transformation. Um, which we certainly learned a lot about if uh, all of those of you who were able to be a part of uh, the keynote this morning. So we want to experience a rich discussion, your direct and honest feedback and your insightful questions. And with that, Paul, I'll, uh, or Tracy, or Paul, who am I sending off to? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Denise, and thank all of you again for being here with us for this very important panel, as Denise mentioned, is one of four that we're hosting around the revised draft standards that we're so excited to put out there, as Denise mentioned. So we're going to be spending our time today over a little under the next two hours in three main areas on the agenda. Uh, one is to give you a quick overview of the standards revision process, where we've been, where we're going with this process. Second is the main part is to have a truly interactive session with our four outstanding panelists around this topic of transformation and how it connects to the revised standards. Uh, and we hope that you'll utilize the chat box freely for comments and questions at that time for our panelists, because we do wanna make this very interactive. And then finally, we'll be um, showing you and discussing the revised draft standards through both the overview and an example of one of the standards that has a structure that is repeated across all 10. And then finally, we'll reiterate kind of the opportunity for the public commentary through January 15th uh, and talk about next steps. So again, thank you all for being here. We're really excited to be with all of you. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Tracy to walk through uh, where we've been with the journey of the standards with Learning Forward. So Tracy. All right, thanks Paul. Um, so just a little bit of background, and as uh, both Denise and Paul mentioned, we're um, talking throughout the conference about the standards revision, and uh, this is part of our effort, uh, and, and even calling them revision labs, is part of our effort to make this a really transparent, collaborative process, uh, informed by you, by the field, uh, by some of the folks that, that Paul will get into in a little bit, and so thank, thank you for coming to this and thank you for whatever uh, input you have the capacity to provide over the next six weeks on the first draft that's out there. So uh, we're honored that you choose to spend time with us today. And uh, so just a bit of background on the standards. Uh, the, you see the cover of our current standards released in 2011. 
And our standards for professional learning describe the conditions for and elements of high quality professional learning that leads to improvements in educator practice and student results. Uh, the revision that's in process now will lead us toward what would be, what will be the fourth version of standards for professional learning. And built into their premise from the beginning is that they reflect to the extent possible the current education and research landscape. And at the same time, we strive for a balance between currency and uh, they must endure over, over years. Uh, as you can see, this has sort of been a roughly 10 year cycle, um, give or take. Uh, first standards were released in 1994, 1995 then revised in 2001 and then in 2011. And so our uh, current standards uh, have been out there for not quite 10 years, but they will be by the time the fourth edition is out there. Uh, our, our current standards, which are appearing on the screen now, um, have been adopted or adapted into policy in 35 states and are widely embraced in districts and systems across North America and across the globe. And we know educators at all levels in systems use them for understanding high quality professional learning, for planning, facilitation, evaluation, and, and really the professional learning they experience. The seven current standards work in concert and that's always been true. These. Uh, work together as a system. You don't pick your favorite and, and focus on that one. And certainly in the learning about them and understanding them, we study each of them deeply and we uh, strive to implement them together as a system. Uh, and the standards you see in front of you, this provides the, um, we build on the shoulders of every standards that come before us. So. Uh, learning Forward's 50 years of experience in leading professional learning uh, are part of the deep, deep well that goes into our, our current revision. And so you will see um, the threads that tie uh, from the 2011 standards to our upcoming standards and then and back through our history. So I just want to say uh, we appreciate so much the work uh, that the work to revise standards. If we look at the next slide. We have uh, three philanthropic funders in this work, and that's been true over our history as well. Um, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation are all funders of this work. And we're so grateful for their commitment to high quality professional learning and that they recognize the importance of revised standards. So thank you for that generous commitment. And so now, Paul, if you'll share a bit about our process in revising standards. Great, thank you, Tracy. And um, as Tracy mentioned, we wanted to make sure that we were not doing this independently of uh, using incredible experts from the field. And so we convened the Standards uh, Advisory Council in the spring of this year, right around the time of COVID in the beginning. Uh, but the idea is to have a group of, of experts providing ongoing feedback, expertise, um, critical feedback for forming this revision of this very, very important work. And some of you may have been on our uh, standards lab yesterday with equity and the expression came up about embracing and hugging a cactus sometimes and being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I think what's really been powerful is our group, as you'll see uh, on the next two slides, kind of a representation of, of helping us think and probe more deeply and challenge assumptions around both the current standards and what has changed so much as Tracy mentioned in the last 10 years, um, especially regarding uh, the ongoing importance for equity in reaching all students, the ongoing um, piece around the whole child and social emotional learning, just to name a couple. And so this group of 25 really represents uh, everything from uh, Linda Roust, who is the Montana Teacher of the Year and finalist for National Teacher of the Year, representing a classroom leader. We have, um, building level leaders at the principal level, district leaders, including, uh, you'll hear from Leilani earlier, of one of our outstanding district leaders on the panel, uh, state leaders, researchers, and university leaders representing um, national level, as well as national and international organizations, as you'll also hear from Tony McKay, is one of those important um, thought leaders as well. So that's what's really been gratifying is to have this group 
uh, coming together with us regularly and will continue to meet uh, both with shaping the revised standards and then also the suite of implementation and monitoring tools that will be coming as well. So <clears throat> you'll see on this next slide then the structure is we have just a very high level uh, overview of our advisory council structure where we have our group of 25, we meet on a regular basis. And then we also have in addition now um, the plan to have four working groups that go beyond uh, these 25 that are on the advisory council in terms of these four areas, uh, research team, writing and content development team, specifically with the implementation tools that will be coming, a district, state and province team to really look carefully at the revised standards and that intersection of policy and practice and what, that, what are the implications for uh, practitioners and policymakers to make sure that is aligned. And then finally, a review team that will make sure before the final uh, version is we'll share on the timeline later in the session today when to make sure everything is set. Uh, we right now have the research team in place and Elizabeth in a moment will share who is on that and the focus. And then we will also be inviting and convening those three subsequent teams, the writing district and review teams in 2021 uh, as we continue the work for both revising the standards and the implementation uh, tool development as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth to talk a little bit about the research team and also the agenda for the research team. So Elizabeth. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yes, I am fortunate enough to be able to work with this first working team, which is the research, research team. And uh, as you can see from the slide in front of you, it's an esteemed and experienced group. It's also a very actively engaged group. And so we've been fortunate to be able to work with them over the past eight months or so. Um, this team is working in the way that uh, the other working teams will, um, will work as well in terms of advising us about the revision, providing resources, challenging us, asking uh, difficult questions and engaging in conversation with us as we've been writing the draft revised standards. And I'll say that this team is one, um, one way we are updating the research foundation for the revision. We have this strong team working with us to provide recommendations and studies, their own studies, as well as others that they feel are important to the revision. We've also been um, internally receiving a lot of feedback and recommendations and studies of, that we should, oops, I didn't mean to do that, that we should review um, as we're writing the updated draft. So in addition to the research team, uh, we've been receiving recommendations from colleagues, from the advisory council, our own consultants, affiliate leaders, and then early reviewers of the draft standards who have added um, references and citations and suggested studies that we should look at as we're uh, crafting those updated standards. The other interesting um, aspect of, of this work is that we are building a research agenda for learning forward that will last, that will um, continue after the release of the standards. So there are questions that are um, coming up as we look at the literature review that we are ad will address as subsequent projects and subsequent, subsequent um, products after the release of the standards. And that's been a really exciting development for us as a standards team and as a staff as well. One of the um, first building blocks of this research update for us has been to work with AIR on a literature review of uh, randomized control trial studies that include an outcome that, I, that focus on a particular professional learning intervention and an observable outcome of teacher practice as well as improved student outcomes. And you'll see that AIR was able to look at 38 studies that fit into these very tight parameters 
and found some key takeaways around the um, related to the framework of the current standards. They found evidence of the concepts of all of the 2011 standards and also found evidence of important research related to some emerging areas of interest that will be addressed in the revised draft, including content expertise, high quality curriculum and instructional materials and coaching. Um, we had been, uh, we gathered some early feedback from um, colleagues and those experienced with the current standards and asked them what they saw as emerging areas of interest and need of additional research and exploration. And um, AIR took, that on, took on that list of um, emerging areas of interest and did some research around that. And so that's been helpful in guiding the writing of the revision and then in thinking about the weighting of particular concepts across all of the standards. And this is an internal literature review that we've been using as a staff and that the advisory council has been um, looking at and providing feedback about and will release selected findings from it in a new paper early in the coming year. That literature review also led to a next step with AIR, which is a meta-analysis focused on those initial studies with the addition of about 20, 25 studies that are less stringent on the student outcomes measure. So we sort of want them to look at an expanded um, set of studies for a meta-analysis to more fully identify and parse out particular elements of professional learning that result in um, outcomes related to teaching practice and student outcomes. And we're exploring the idea, um, pending partnerships and funding and next steps of another meta-analysis that looks at teacher outcomes that are not observable, such as changes in mindset, and beliefs. And we think that'll be a really exciting um, next step that comes out of this research partnership with AIR. Um, I will say that overall, um, with the literature review and the meta-analysis coding conversation so far, it's been really interesting to think about the overlapping concepts that cross multiple standards. And that's been something that we've paid a lot of attention to as we've been writing the revised standards, just being clear about where a particular concept rests and then how it's referenced in other standards. The research has helped us, has helped guide that kind of conversation. It's also revealed that um, studies, especially um, rigorous, what we call rigorous studies, um, randomized control style studies, often don't explore concepts of equity and context in the way that we know they are important to represent in the standards. So that those have been two areas where it's been very important for us as a team to look at um, meta-analyses, uh, look at meta-analyses, look at case studies, look at um, evaluations of uh, particular professional learning strategies in addition to the randomized control trial studies that AIR has helped us um, better understand. So um, in closing, I'll just say that we are, as part of our invitation to review the standards draft, are eager for your input about additional studies or research you would point us to that seems relevant in your review of the revised draft. Uh, so just the more input, the better at this stage. Thank you. I'll turn it back to Paul. Yep, I think we'll go to Tracy next. On, oh, on. Tracy. Uh, so just to, as we get ready to hear from our panel, uh, just looking ahead a bit and thinking about what what are some of the key issues that we really focus on uh, as we look at the revision of standards for professional learning and just recognizing that in, in 2020, we, we understand so much more about what constitutes an effective professional learning system. 
uh, what effective coaching looks like, what effective learning teams, how they operate, uh, what does leadership in professional learning look like. Um, and as Elizabeth said, we draw on a broad base of evidence um, and also what we hear from our stakeholders in the field. So, it, you know, when we think about 2011 and college and career ready standards had just come out. Uh, and what we know now uh, about implementation of those standards, as well as the large body of research around high quality instructional materials is so critical to the revision. Uh, and our aspirations to equity have much greater clarity now than they did. Um, and we also know more from stakeholders and the wisdom of the field about what's important in supporting implementation and policy shifts and deep understanding on the part of all those who play a role in implementing a professional learning system. So um, uh, I'll mention when I, when I uh, said implementation, uh, so past standards for professional learning have always had implementation supports in the form of IC maps and uh, SAI, the standards assessment inventory, uh, as well as a variety of other tools. And so the, uh, that will also be true of the fourth edition of standards for professional learning. And we will develop and release those uh, implementation tools when new standards are released. Uh, so you will see uh, information coming across email and various other platforms about uh, implementation tools in progress uh, over the course of 2021 so that when new standards come out, we equip educators with tools to uh, deeply understand and implement um, from the beginning. So we're very excited about that. At the same time, we will continue to push for policy adoption and adaptation because uh, policy impacts practice. And to the extent that we can um, get the support of our policymakers in terms of providing resources, uh, pressure and support, uh, making the statements about what is important uh, for educators and the kind of learning they should experience. Uh, the full system is what we work towards. So, um, I think we will move toward our uh, conversation now. And as I mentioned at the beginning, those of us who are not panelists or the moderator will uh, please turn off, turn off cameras and we'll see the faces of our um, discussants. Uh, please continue the conversation in the chat box. We'd love to have questions for the panelists. I know Denise will be uh, moderating the conversation and uh, if you are um, comfortable when you look at your video settings, you can uh, choose to hide non-video participants. So we see their faces uh, bigger up there. Um, otherwise, we welcome the panel to the stage. Thank you, Tracy. So I'm excited to get started. So first of all, our illustrious panel, uh, if you would please introduce yourselves and your organizations. And Tony, we're gonna to start with you, uh, followed with by Jackie, Leilani, and Stephanie. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Denise. And when you say you're starting with me, do you mean for a brief introduction first? Just a brief introduction <laughs> first of you, yourself, and your organization. Then, okay. go, then I'll, I'll bring you back. <laughs> Good, yeah, you don't want me to launch into a 25-minute lecture. No, I guess. Not yet. <laughs> uh, so it's uh, Anthony McKay. I am the, um, the CEO and president of the National Centre on Education and the Economy, which some of you will know is based in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, at the moment, I'm, I'm not quite in Washington, D.C. Um, I uh, live my life... Um, about two thirds of my time in the US and the remaining time based in Australia. But unfortunately, since March, it's been very difficult to get back to the US uh, from uh, Melbourne, Australia. So I'm coming to you at uh, the glorious time zone of quarter to 4 a.m. Uh, Melbourne time. But I have to say, I don't feel disconnected because every day has been a joy, at least six to eight hours of Zoom meetings with my colleagues all across the US. So uh, it's been an amazing time. What a year. 
Thank you so much, Tony, for being here. <laughs> Jackie? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jackie Wilson, um, and I am the Executive Director of the National Policy Board for Educational Administration. If you're not familiar with the organization, it repre we represent the uh, professional organizations like the National Elementary Principals, Secondary Principals, the Superintendents, the Chief School Officers, and then the two university faculty organizations that um, are uh, develop uh, leadership preparation programs. That would be the International Council of Professors and then the University Council of Educational Administration. So we have a board and our primary focus is really looking at, uh, we, have, we have standards for which are the foundation for what we would hope to expect to see our school leaders exhibit in schools and in districts. So those are called the Professional Standards for Educational Leaders. And then the NELP, or those are the National Education Leader Preparation Standards. So um, that is what I do um, part-time. I'm also um, a faculty member at the University of Delaware, which you can see on my background screen. Uh, and I run a center for professional development. So I'm deeply, deeply uh, interested in the work of uh, these professional learning standards. So I'm so happy to be with you today. Thank you, Jackie. Leilani. Greetings, everyone. Jackie, you have a lot of jobs. <laughs> so my main role, and really I have such a focus on this role at this point in my career, is Director of Staff Development in Gwinnett County Public Schools. We're checking in from Georgia. We are the largest district in Georgia. And what I have been charged to do is to develop our over 20,000 staff members with a dynamic team. So thank you all for being here. Great, Lilani, thank you. And Stephanie. Good morning. Um, well, after 30 plus years of dedicating my life to learning forward, um, I was given the opportunity to continue to live out my passion by um, continuing to consult with my colleague, dear friend, um, Jim Short at the Carnegie Corporation. And so um, I continue to think about these important issues every day and delighted to be here. Wonderful, thank you, Stephanie. So each panel member is going to spend um, a, 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 the time they need to really ground us in our to topic of transformation. And I'm gonna give you the first question that we would like uh, them to answer. Um, and here's the question. Based upon your experience and expertise, why is this area of focus transformation critical for educators and how does it connect with and support the other areas of focus in the revised standards? And I'm going to ask Tony to kick us off. Uh, you have tremendous and incredible skill in framing an issue. And um, you can then hand off to Jackie and so on and feel free, free to play off one another and respond to one another um, in any way you see fit. But uh, let's start with the first question. Tony? Great. Um, Denise, thank you. Uh, and uh, I know we've only got about five minutes, so I'm going to really have a, a kind of um, fast uh, go at trying to locate uh, this work in what I see as being the big conversation that's taking place globally. Now, and I, Denise, I promise you, I'll make some reference to the question you've asked me. Yes. Uh, but, you know, okay. <laughs> a great educator always interprets the question, yeah? Yes, <laughs> so, always. Uh, okay, so um, this is what I really want to try and say, first of all. This is world-class work that is of a different order, I think now, than what I see uh, in other places uh, because of the commitment that we've made to um, really a two-year uh, investment with the kind of research that you would expect from a standards-based profession. If there was a time when Richard Elmore said that we could be accused of being a profession without a practice, that time's gone. Yep, this is, this is really clear now 
that we are a mature profession. A mature profession is standards based. And when you start talking about contemporary standards for professional learning, you know that you are refreshing the strength of your profession to have the impact on, as we know, the quality of our teaching and the quality of the learning outcomes for young people. That's this game. And given the fact that I've done this work in other places, including leading uh, standard setting organizations in Australia and New Zealand, but more recently being associated with the work that's being done in a similar space across uh, five or six high performing countries. That's Estonia, Finland, British Columbia, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong. This work is world-class work. Um, and it just strikes me that uh, we need to be clear <laughs> uh, just how important this is and just how um, high quality this work is uh, because a profession needs this to have the kind of uh, confidence about its practice. So point number one, we are in a remarkable place and strengthening what were already a fantastic set of standards that have been guiding our practice uh, over the last decade or more. Point number two, um, I take the points that Tracy has made in particular about the fact, don't pick and choose. There are 10, right? Uh, there are 10, if you like, standards here that make up the system and it is the system. And I, I don't wanna say more about that because it just make, it, it strikes me that that's been underlined in the introduction. And it's clear for those that have looked at the document that when you go through each of those areas across the three categories, you get an understanding of why all of them are interdependent. Uh, I know that we're focused, or I know that I'm focused on the, the transformational nature uh, of uh, professional work and the transformational processes that we've identified. But again, I'm not going to spend uh, the next three minutes <laughs> uh, in calling those out. Instead, I want to say that I think that we've gone a long way further than the way in which we used to think about the nature of this work. That was, you invest uh, in, in professional learning, right? Standards for professional learning by making sure that we have the knowledge and the skills and the dispositions and the values absolutely vital and you keep on investing in that knowledge base. Second, you have an element of relative autonomy in this profession and you have to make incredible decisions at multiple levels and your capacity to do that requires protocols and standards that give you a basis on which you can make those judgments. And next, you are part of a collaborative profession. If you do this by yourself without recognizing that you must be connected to other professionals, you will never get the level of professional practice and impact on learning that you need. Now, that's great. I think that's what we've already known. And I know that, in fact, the previous standards, in a sense, the current standards, really drove that home. But here's my three new transformational points that I think the standards speak to. The first is this game that we're in has moral purpose of a kind that you simply can't duck. You are not an educator unless you're in the transformational business. And I mean transformation of yourself, transformation of young people in their learning and their lives. This is about graduating educated citizens with global competence, right? Who are committed to being first-class human beings that are absolutely committed to justice and equity, right? At a time when we're talking about systemic racism and systemic inequity, if your learning system can't tackle those challenges, you're not going to get educated citizens, you're not going to get an educated society, you're not going to get humanity at the level that we need it in order to cope with our problems. So first and foremost, let's be clear about the purpose, the why of learning. And that's what these transformational standards refer to. That's why it is so important that, in fact, we pick up on not just transformation of learning systems and the transformation of young people, the transformation of yourself in order to be adequate to this task is absolutely vital. And that's why these standards come alive in that sense. Number two, they tell us about the what and the how of learning, right? We are not a profession without a practice. We have, 
an evidence base. We have the learning sciences, right? We've got the old OECD. When I say the old OECD, seven principles of learning, it was only 10 years ago that we actually crafted them. You remember them, learners at the center, recognize individual differences. Learning is essentially social. Learning is essentially emotional. Stretch all students, assessment for learning. Make sure you build the horizontal connections, right? They, they were absolutely central and have become central to our work. But let me just be clear. We now have got a lot more knowledge about the learning sciences than we did before, and therefore we can apply it. We know that we ourselves in order to learn have to have experiences that make us alive, right? That we have to have the discipline of repeated practice, that we have to apply our learning in real world situations. That's what young people need. That's what the learning sciences tell us. We've got the best work globally around the learning sciences in the US. And if you wanna take the volumes of how people learn as we have, right, as some of our reference points, there's an enormous amount there. So we are in a very good place now, but if you combine it with learning analytics, with big data, with technology enabled assessment, then you're really in a space where the profession can take this work forward. And so my feeling is that we've got to be clear about how we apply the knowledge base we've now got, and we are. In this work, it's transformational in that sense. But the big transformation, let's not lose 2020, this crazy year, right, of COVID-19. If there's ever been a moment in which we can redesign our places of learning, right? This is be and, and apply pedagogies that are much, much more powerful in the service of young people's learning and our own learning. So let me be clear about this. I know that we are talking about standards for professional learning, right? But then think about the read across uh, as you think about the, the way in which we think about young people's learning. That's the whole purpose here. Yep, in the service of. But let's be clear, I think we're gonna have to redesign our learning environments in the ways that we've been talking about. And I know you can just simply go to online and blend it and digital. It's a lot more sophisticated than that. I think these standards call forth uh, the fact that we as a profession will need to learn how to do that design work and that implementation work. In fact, in the transformational category, that's what's explicitly referred to. But I wanna finish with this. It's not just the where of learning, it's also the with whom. This has got to be a moment, surely, in which we recognise that this is deeply collaborative work. Sure, it's about coaching, about leadership and about feedback, but it's a more diversified workforce. And it's actually in cooperation with allied professionals. This brings our work together with others, I think, in very powerful ways. And the revised standards of professional learning call forth those opportunities. And by the way, we're not just talking about classrooms. Right, we're talking now about formal, informal, non-formal, in school, out of school, like the opportunities for us to harness all of that, I think are fantastic. And that means that our standards for professional learning need to be adequate to the moral purpose, the why of learning. They've got to be adequate to the, the what and the how, the pedagogies that go with uh, now, I think, uh, these standards. And we've got to be adequate to the where the learning takes place and who we do the learning with. And that's why I'm so excited about these standards. They address in a genuine way, the transformational challenge that we've got. And I know that was more than five minutes and I apologize. But what a frame we got for the conversation and for the discussion. Thank you so much, Tony. Really put it out there. So, Jackie. Well, that's a great way to kick yes. off. Tony, I'm just great gonna- I'm just going to build on that eloquent, uh, inspiring um, opening because it, you, it really was inspiring and, ch and actually challenges us all to do more and better. We have, as you say, at this moment in time, uh, and I saw that someone put in the chat box, never waste a crisis, and I agree. So, uh, so I want to begin by talking about why I believe these, the, this standards revision is so very important and never been more important. Um, I have had the good fortune in my career, a very long career in, in K-12 education, to work both in a school, in a district, at a department of education, and at two universities. And because of that uh, experience, 
I have learned over time how critically important stand, professional standards are. They are our foundation. Some people call them a foundation. Others say they're our umbrella. I kind of call them a roadmap because they really do lay out uh, where we want to go, what we want to be, how we want to behave in our profession. So as I think about these standards and how, they ha how we have an opportunity to influence both uh, district and state policy for the better, I wanna begin with, um, when, I, when I think of transformation, I think of two things. And Tony, you said it so well. It is collaboration, and it is integration. And we don't have a set of 10 siloed standards that stand by themselves that we say, okay, we'll do this and now we'll do this and now we'll do this. It's an opportunity to look at them you know, as they intersect and help us think about our work. So looking from the frame of school leadership where I spend a lot of my time, I think about how, these how we will use these standards to build the capacity of leaders to do this work. And I'm talking about teachers in the classroom who lead every day from their classroom and support principals and assistant principals and how they also support district leaders like Leilani who we'll hear later in doing the big picture work in their districts. So I think it's really, really important that we think about exactly what uh, you know, Anthony said to us is we have to look inside at ourselves. And if you look at the transformational process, one of the, the first two areas that really caught, caught my attention on the study group was the equi equity drivers, because we do have to look at ourselves individually and collectively our own biases and the supports as we collaborate with diverse colleagues. That is really important. That is part of transformation and transforming the system. We have to really bring people together with different ideas to think about the students we serve and how we serve them better. And that takes leadership. It takes leadership from the classroom. It takes leaders, leadership as building leaders and district leaders and our universities who are preparing our teachers and our principals. So I really think we, you know, we sometimes think that these standards just kind of stay housed in um, the K-12 world, but I'm seeing more and more a greater interest at the university as we prepare our teachers for teaching, that they we have to think about their long-term careers and their professional learning and what that's going, what they're going to need uh, as they step into their classrooms early. The other thing that I really think is really important is the piece on evidence, which is so very important. As someone who has been a practitioner my entire career and now at a university, where I'm seeing the importance is, is that as educators, we Sometimes we're led by our heart, sometimes by our gut. As a principal, many times it was by my gut. But sometimes that makes us be very reactive. What these standards are forcing us to do is to begin to see where the research can inform the practice. And that's one of the reasons I'm so thrilled at the process learning forward is taken and really looking at the research and the studies that really can have informed these, these standards. And so helping our our leaders understand as they're transforming schools for, for students, that they're looking at research to inform their decisions, testing ideas and seeing what is working and what is not. And when it doesn't work, then we make a course correction or a change. And that we have an opportunity to really, really begin to think about um, the, what we know now. And, and Tony, you said this so well, we know so much more about learning sciences and how we teach children and how children learn and, and what strategies are most successful with certain um, students. And so I think we just, this transformation piece to me is so powerful because I think it really encourages us to, to say to policy leaders, standards are important. They will be our roadmap. They will be our umbrella. They will be our foundation for the kinds of skills, knowledge, and dispositions we want to see for those who are leading our schools, those who are uh, working with teachers to design the kinds of instructional strategies we want to see, how the curriculum we select, the assessments we put in place. So I really believe it's an opportunity uh, for us to have uh, a lot of change, very positive change in our school system. 
So Denise, I hope I answered your question. Absolutely, Jackie. Thank you so much. These are um, powerful insights and frames for our discussion. Uh, Lailani, I wanna go to you. Yeah, for your thank you. absolutely. Thank you, Tony and Jackie. We certainly have, I'm fired up over here because <laughs> we certainly have each calls to action, right? In our personal and our professional lives. And so I really appreciate that the standards for professional learning help us to professionalize the profession so that we not only rise up to the call for action, but we have some guidance and some ways in which to do that, especially in this role as I'm thinking about the big picture of serving all of our staff, most importantly, serving the staff so that we can better serve our students. You know, I'm gonna take a chapter from my own personal book when I think about the importance of standards. It's been an interesting ride and journey for me to serve on the council and almost full circle because I say that this district raised me as a professional because I certainly started young and have stayed in this district all of these years. And so when I started as a classroom teacher, unbeknownst to me, our district had already written in the current standards into our professional learning policy. And so as I was attending sessions and attending collaborative and you know, meetings with our teams, I did not realize then that the transformation was not happening by happenstance, that those that were in this seat you know, previously to me and decision makers within our district were truly coming around the table and thinking about how the standards could help to transform me as an educator so that I could then get to the ones that are closest to student learning, which are students. And so it has been powerful for me to really look again at these standards and think about, again, that guidance that I can provide those educators coming into the classroom, such as I did. Some would even say, um, in terms of transformation that you're not even learning unless it's transformational. And so I ran across a quote from a very reputable source called Pinterest that um, underscores this thinking. And it says, change is inevitable, but transformation is by conscious choice. And so I wanted to pause and just share with you all some reflections that I've had since serving on the council. I've been in, um, as I mentioned, the role of teacher. I've been in um, instructional coach at the local school, a district instructional coach. I've been a coordinator over our alternative certification program. I've been in high school administrator and now in this role as director of professional learning. And when I truly think about what has guided me to this point and guided me to this point, I think about the transformational process at each of those levels. And so I'm gonna call out some of the revised standards um, because just that's the way that I process. So as Jackie mentioned, the equity drivers, if it was not for time for intentional reflection, if it wasn't a time for me to meet and collaborate with colleagues, I know that I would not have been transformed in the way that I have been today. Also, um, Tony mentioned the informal and the formal and the differentiated ways that we learn. Those are learning designs that were very specific to my needs. I had folks pour into me and I was able to pour into others and again, in a formal and an informal way. Also, of course, doing the work, implementing the work and then really digging into how to assess that as we have mentioned and the impact that that has had on students and staff has been one of my guiding points in terms of transformation. And so that's just a little bit of how I have been transformed and been able to show up in a different way each day because really those underscored standards that were embedded into the district. And as I lift that up and transfer that, I think about how I can continue that work through these revised standards through the lens of transformation. So again, those new educators that are coming in, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed as I was then, they may not know exactly how to name and identify the standards, but they will certainly hopefully experience the benefits and the fruit of us that are coming around and looking through the lens of transformation and the under, other standards. And of course, they work in concert, right? So when we think about um, the conditions in which I personally was able to transform 
we also know that those conditions need to be in place in the new standards and the current standards as well really call that out. And of course, a rigorous curriculum, you know, as much as we consider the culture, which is so important, if teachers don't know what to teach and, and don't have an equitable and relevant and historical pedagogy in which to teach through, then again, we're not reaching those that we want to, which are our students. And so that's transformation for me. Um, and that is really the importance of standards for professional learning. Thank you so much, Leilani. Um, taking from the big picture and then really getting down to what it really takes at every level to start thinking about the implementation and the growth that's really required for self and others in this process as both you and uh, Tony have alluded to. Um, Stephanie, bring it home. All right. <laughs> Everybody's been wonderful. Um, in fact, this is the third action lab that Learning Forward has hosted. And I've been a participant and an observer in the first two. And I'm really delighted to be a contributor in this one. Um, at each one of them, the panelists have offered really insightful and compelling observations. And I think these have been ab among the best. So I'll just say that. <laughs> um, Leilani, you are an astute educator with a broad range of experience. Um, I've always been a big admirer of yours and you have the, the joy of working in a system that gets the importance of professional learning and then has the results to show for it. And Jackie, your experiences at the university level, at the state level, have allowed you to see how you create policies that the importance of policies that advance professional learning and then what happens in terms of when you invest in it in that way and the outcomes that you can get in a leading state like Delaware, which has been held up by Learning Forward as an exemplar. And I don't know what I can say about Tony. <laughs> you know, a tremendous thought leader, a former advisor of mine, an individual I've admired for years in your international perspective is critical to ensuring that these standards are embraced around the world. It's your voice that's going to make a difference for so many who are going to look to see why they should pay attention to learning forward standards. And speaking of this whole notion of enduring, the fact that the standards you know, are on a 10 year review cycle indicates how important it is that learning forward get it right. And I know that the entire advisory panel is committed to helping, but it, I want to say it's equally important that the participants in the room, um, the participants who attended the other action labs, take the opportunity to give feedback on the standards. You're the ones who are going to live with them, who are going to implement them, and Learning Forward really needs to hear from you. Overall, I think Tracy uh, mentioned, you know, and I'd like to affirm how the revised standards address some of the biggest changes our education systems have experienced in the last decade. Uh, yesterday, there was a discussion about new, the new college and career ready standards and the research on high quality curriculum materials and professional learning to support its implementation and the discovery and needs from two pandemics, COVID and racial inequality. And at the same time, the proposed standards focus on the foundational things that continue to matter, the essential resources that we need for effective professional learning, the importance of teacher and teaching quality on student performance and attention to building and system leadership for realizing uh, substantive and sustainable results. So let me turn my attention to the transformation standards. Um, and as they've been described in other sessions, the process and how-to standards. And I thought I was going to be really original in what I was about to say, but all three of you kind of caught the same theme. So it doesn't hurt to reinforce, I'm hoping. Um, I think Learning Forward has the opportunity to use the term transformation to signal much more importance of these standards. 
And like many of you, I looked up the word transformation and the definition I found was that it represents thorough or dramatic change. And that is exactly what we've learned, particularly in the last year is necessary as a result of the worldwide COVID pandemic and closer to home, our racial inequality crisis. And where Tony elaborated just beautifully in his remarks as well. The transformational standards are responsible ultimately for guiding the process of professional learning. And transformation means that we are talking about transforming teachers' practices, teachers' beliefs, and teachers' assumptions. It involves deliberate and intentional choices regarding the design and implementation of adult learning. Now, these choices are also informed by the careful scrutiny of the research and evidence, and including, as Maria Heiler mentioned so beautifully yesterday, that we need to, through the equity consideration panel, that some evidence may have been overlooked because of the biases built into the current systems of how we look at the research. And I liked the nod to that that Elizabeth made in her remarks this morning as well. Transformational change in practice, as well as beliefs and assumptions, often requires and benefits from experiences that promote cognitive dissonance. And it's followed by facilitated opportunities that promote analysis and reflection that Leilani mentioned and is represented in the equity driver. And these, are, these opportunities are critical because as we all know, long held practices and beliefs actually may be inhibiting educators from fully investing in transformational change. Consider this, the gap between teacher preparation, teacher professional learning, and what teachers need to successfully bring all students to the achievement levels that we want for them. And I'm hopeful that the design and implementation standards will actually guide systems to address this gap. But to be more successful, we need to be more intentional in how we apply, and Tony referenced this this morning, the science of learning. We often speak of it for students and we need to speak of it for adults as well. So I wanna just take my last minute to talk about what I mean about more intentional design. It means professional learning mirrors what we want to see in classrooms and schools. More intentional design means teachers are given the opportunity to experience as students first the practices that we expect them to use with their students. And in other words, if we want to see inquiry-based learning in classrooms, then teachers need to experience inquiry-based professional learning. Jim Short addressed these points powerfully yesterday, very articulately in the session on curriculum. And I encourage all of you to go back to that recording and watch it. More intentional design means teachers are provided high quality instructional materials in the job embedded support that's anchored in learning how to implement it with integrity as Eric Hirsch referenced in that same session addressing the needs, interests and capacities of their students. And more intentional design means teachers collaborate and engage in purposeful reflection and planning on how to transform their classrooms to meet district instructional vision. Finally, more intentional design results from methodically planned lessons for adult learners. The importance of these transformational or functional features of professional learning are often underestimated and undervalued. Sages on the stage and razzle-dazzle performers undermine our profession. And I hope that these transformation standards compel people to re-examine all practices and to truly transform the learning process for all adults in the future. Only then will we achieve our shared vision and as Tony said, our moral purpose. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Stephanie. My gosh, um, you all have just done an incredible job of sharing the full uh, trajectory of transformation at every level and uh, from every perspective. And first and foremost, before going to the questions, I just want to give you each the opportunity if there's something that you just have to speak to that one of the others said or that you want to reinforce or I'm going to give you that opportunity now because so much was so powerful in setting us up for the discussion to come from uh, the participants. Anybody want to speak to anything that just is hot for you at this moment? Denise, I'd just love to be able to, to, uh, to uh, in a sense, underscore what Stephanie has reminded us of, and that is that this learning is um, um, central to the job. Yes. <laughs> so, so if it's not job embedded, if we don't design our use of time, space and people, in order to ensure that we privilege our own professional learning in the way that Stephanie has outlined, we can never be the effective professionals and have the impact on student learning that we desire. And it just strikes me that we say it, but we don't live it. And if these, if these standards as the previous ones really encourage us to think about how we will redesign our own use of time in order to ensure that our learning is fully embedded and we are doing exactly as Stephanie has outlined. If these standards can just uh, encourage that shift, and it is a shift, and a lot's going to have to change, i.e. there'll have to be larger transformation <laughs> in order to have the enabling conditions for these standards to really impact our work. Yep, I just think that's so important, Stephanie, you've underscored it brilliantly. Absolutely. And one of our questions really is, is transformation really possible without a total, as you all have been speaking to, a total reinvention of schools and systems? And I'll let any of you start. Well, I'll, I'll just, I believe it's got to be possible, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to start believing in it, but I also see it in many places these days. I mean, I've had the opportunity to actually observe um, transformational professional learning um, over, I mean, I've had more opportunities to learn and to observe professional learning in action when I haven't, wasn't sitting and learning forward. So it's just given me an opportunity to explore. Um, and I'm just inspired by things that I see um, in the way that people transform real professional learning. And it, some, one of the programs that has really inspired me is Open Syed, which is implementation of what will be a free um, uh, set of materials for people to implement high quality materials to implement inquiry-based science. And the approach that they use in engaging teachers is exactly the approach that they expect teachers to use with students. And it does create cognitive dissonance for teachers. And they are able um, to do it even during COVID. Like they found ways to do it online and still have teachers engaged in, in inquiry-based learning. And they're not using a train-the-trainer model. They're trying to get to every teacher in the pilot. And so I believe it can happen. And, um, and I think we all believe it can happen or we wouldn't be de dedicating ourselves to this profession. And what you're saying is you've got to start somewhere. And even yeah. though your, your goal is the total reinvention and you're right. looking at all aspects of it, you start somewhere really important and then you make sure you're applying um, all of the standards across uh, so that you have a deep understanding of what it takes to get to that total reinvention. Anyone else want to respond to this question? Denise, oh. Yeah, uh, Denise, this is Jackie. I, you know, Stephanie, that you've made such a good point. And I, I just want to say is for somebody who spends a lot of time working with uh, principals um, and 
this what we what principals and teachers have been experiencing since March has been probably the most stressful time ever in schools. And I think what it has done is forced us to shift leadership roles. So there, no one taught us how to do virtual classrooms and to be able to engage kids this way for this long. And with no, with very little training, there may have been some schools where there had been some professional learning, but we were asking our teachers and our principals to do something they had never done and to do it while flying the plane. And what I have observed, and this is after being engaged with probably over a hundred principals from across the country, is, is that teachers and principals came together as colleagues, not as a, in a role where I'm the boss and you're the teacher and I'm gonna tell you how to do it because guess what? I don't know how to do this right, but together collectively. And I think that's what high quality professional learning is when the, when the principals and assistant principals get together with their support staff and their classroom teachers and they come around problems of practice and they come together and they really begin to define problems create so, solutions and test ideas. And I'm, I have just, I think right now uh, where we see so much inequity and so many kids who are not getting what they need and the lack of training for, for the principals I talk to, it has really emphasized to them the importance of high quality professional learning because they saw what was happening when they didn't have it, when teachers were being asked to do things with absolutely no training at all. And look, teachers are resilient and they figure it out, they're creative, but it has been, I think an eye opener kind of peel, I always say it, we've been peeling back the onion and some places we don't like what we see, but I really do think that we have an opportunity like no other to really take these standards and for school leaders, their own standards, the professional standards for education leaders, half of their standards are around, you know, creating, um, uh, is managing curriculum, instruction, assessment, building professional learning culture for teachers. So it really is in their best interest if they really want to lead an excellent school to really get an understanding of these standards and how they can change the quality of instruction in their schools for kids, so the outcomes. So, thank you, Jackie. I think you've actually touched on uh, the the next question we got, which is how can we ensure educators feel that they're part of the transformation, that they're doing it, and not that it's being done to them. So, and I know many of you have spoken to that, but I think that you really got to that. Here's the next question. Unless any of you want to, uh, and and please, team, tell me how much time we have left. About twenty minutes. Oh, we still have. Oh, good. Okay, <laughs> great. I want to. Uh, Denise, good. can I just add to that last please, question? Please, please do I think add. This is about teachers doing it. Um, across the face of the globe, right? The pandemic <laughs> has meant that the profession has been remarkably adaptive. Uh, it has stepped into the most complex space, been hugely innovative worked in partnership, right? And, and has been able to demonstrate how complex this work is and how tough it is. Now, I reckon that is fantastic because we've always had this argument about how do you establish the prestige of, of, of the profession? How do you increase its status? How do we get the recognition we deserve? Well, you know, you get it by doing what we've done namely, right, stepped in to the most complicated and tough set of circumstances and done remarkable work with parents, with other educators. Yeah, I think that is, that's a game changer we must not lose because that has meant that we've had to relearn, unlearn and relearn as a profession how to do things, which actually we wanted to do anyway, but there's nothing like the kind of conditions that we've been operating in that has actually given us that stimulus. And the question for me is, can we avoid going back to the old grammar of schooling? Can we now be clear, which is your opening question, right, around the way in which we design 
our learning environments, to go back to Stephanie's point, where we as a profession are constantly learning. We design that time. We privilege that time. That's how complex the work is. You can't do the work with young people if you don't do the work on yourself and with your colleagues. You can't do the work. So it strikes me that if we could shift, this is the other problem. Often we've done the work for kids. It, we're, it's not, we're not doing the kids learning, the kids are doing the learning. What we are is we are enablers of that learning and we have to set up the conditions in which that learning can take place. And therefore we have to change the, the, the nature of how we think about age grade, how we think about class sizes, how we think about the use of time, how we build in our learning into every single day. Now that means, as you said before, big changes. Yep, I can't see how we can become the kind of professionals with the standards that we're now holding up for ourselves, unless, as you said, we transform the way in which we do the business. And that means that I think young people have got to do more work. I mean, good work, right? Uh, they have got to be absolutely front and centre. Uh, that's where the productivity of learning takes place. And we have to establish the conditions under which that learning can take place. And we now know how we can do that because we've got the standards for our own professional learning. But yeah, short, short uh, response. We better make sure we make these changes. Absolutely. Anyone else want to? I just wanted to, um, I love what Stephanie typed in the chat box that we have already witnessed tremendous transformation. I do want to just honor that question because I think I understand, I think we all understand the intent behind if everything doesn't change, can we truly transform? Um, and I understand that, you know, that kind of goes under conditions. We've all probably been in roles possibly where things weren't moving as quickly or changing as rapidly as we would like because, you know, say there's a classroom teacher and the whole school isn't on board with something. But I appreciate that the standards are aspirational and that we focus on what's in our locus of control, what's in our sphere of influence. And then as Tony said, do that work, you know, do that next best step. Uh, and maybe it's not the big transformation of the whole system, which of course is our goal, but what is it that we can do in our role? If we stay there, then we feel empowered and we actually act, you know, as opposed to kind of thinking about the many barriers. But we know that there are barriers to transformation. We've already talked about cognitive dissonance. Anytime we're pushing against or rubbing up against a belief or a structure or a way of thinking that we've had for many, many years, obviously that's going to cause uh, some rift and some change. We know that change is complex within itself, um, but just starting where we are. Thank you, Leilani. And you bring up a good point, the barriers to this transformation that we talk about. Can we go there and, and, and respond to that question about what are the biggest barriers that people have to face in the transformation, in the change? Oh, Denise, I read a, a great book many years ago when I was training um, uh, principals, and it was a book called Transitions. Um, and it says that in times of great change, people approach change two ways. One, they grieve the change because it, it's the message is, well, if I have to change, then what I was doing was it must not have been very good, and which is not the case. It was good for that time. But that change that the other group of people look at change as a time for great creativity, a great opportunity to be innovative, entrepreneurial. And I think right now, a lot, there's going to be a lot of barriers is, oh, let's just go back to life was so easy. I knew what I was doing. And let's just go back to doing things the way we were doing them. But our teachers have never had to operate in such a transparent way as we have asked them to teach. Parents leaning in, asking questions, walking behind the screen, interrupting the class. I mean, we have, our classrooms are open to anybody who happens to be in that house or wherever the parent, you know, has the, the iPad set up. So we have, and so, and listen, the parents I'm talking to, they had no idea the complexity of our jobs. Educators, they had, I mean, they are begging us please, I can't do this. This is too hard. I can't teach this science lesson. So I think, you know, we have to 
take this moment and not let people forget when, if, you know, if we do decide to go back, we don't want school to be like it was before. Let's take the best of what we've learned and let's, you know, think about the things. Look, in most of the schools that have gone hybrid, kids come in on A-B days, Mondays and Tuesdays, and another group coming in on Thursdays and Fridays. And now on Wednesdays, we use it for professional development for teachers. We couldn't even get four professional development days a year approved. And now we're giving a day a week. I'm not saying that that will ever be the luxury we have. But if we've learned anything is that when we ask people to do innovative, new types of ideas, as these standards certainly lay out for us, we have to give the educators the time to learn you know, learn how to implement, learn how to lead classrooms in this way. And so I think the barriers are going to be, the biggest barrier I see is we were comfortable with what we've all knew. And what we have to say is we can't go back to being that comfortable again. You know, a little discomfort is good if it, if it leads us to better outcomes for kids. So. Well, you've touched on another question that came from the chat box, and that is, how do we create dedicated time to make the kinds of changes that are really transformational? So that's, you were talking of gave it, giving some examples that now that people are beginning to dedicate uh, time, how is it happening? How are people able to do it? And what have you all experienced and heard about in terms of uh, creating this dedicated time, what it really takes? Yeah, you know, you know, and I don't want to be the only one to speak here, but I'm just saying uh, we talk, we work with a lot of principals and they've developed high school and elementary and middle school principals have been working with their teachers to create new schedules so that, you know, if parents opt to bring their kids into school face to face or whether they all want them online, they've kind of got these very creative schedules. But the one thing that they knew they have said is we're asking our teachers to, to teach differently They've got to have time to develop lessons, to think about grouping structures, to think about how to keep students engaged in a virtual environment that they need professional learning opportunities. And so they're building in that one day a week in which that whole day from the teachers I'm talking to, they spend the whole day in professional learning, working on their teaching strategies, writing their lesson plans, bouncing around ideas. Now, I don't understand why we've been able to do it now. Maybe the, the, the pandemic has given us an excuse and why we could never even get four days of professional development a year, you know, when we need more. You know, my mentor who, who has mentored me for 20 years, Joe Murphy from Vanderbilt, who helped write the Peace Health Standards, has said to me so many times, Jackie, you are no good to anyone if you don't fill your own well. How do you lead others if you don't educate yourself, you don't read, you don't engage in conver meaningful conversation with colleagues who challenge your thinking, who make you think about different perspectives? And I'm just saying, I think one of the things we have to do <clears throat> really begin to think about how we make it a priority that professional learning has to be about the way we go about our, our work. Any others? Yes, Stephanie. Well, and I want to follow up with what Jackie was saying and also reference what Joellen put in the chat box, you know, the barrier of will. I yeah, wanted to get yeah. to that. Definitely. Okay, well, the, <laughs> the biggest barrier has always been will. Mm -hmm. And we have found a way, like Jackie was saying, schools have found a way to make collaborative learning and planning a priority during this COVID pandemic. Okay. I, I can't imagine us returning to the way things were. I can't imagine leaders <clears throat> allowing us to ignore the everything that we've learned about racial inequality in this country. And I'm sure similar issues have surfaced in other countries as well. And that in order to address those things, that it's it will be it. It's not, it's not an option to opt out. If you want to opt out, it's time to opt out of the profession because we have to do everything we do to address these system inequities um, that have pervaded for so many years. <clears throat> we have to be willing to learn and address them. And that takes time. And I think parents get it now. 
um, and community leaders get it and yep. our leaders get it. And so we need to seize it and just assume the will exists and move on. That's probably too simple, I don't know. I think, I think though the, the question of time, um, Denise, does, uh, does connect with um, uh, you know, space and people. Because um, it strikes me that um, we want to reconsider uh, the, the enabling conditions for deep learning, yeah? Mm -hmm. And if that's what we're after, deep learning. And if we know that uh, by engaging young people in meaningful deep learning, that we get motivation, <laughs> right? We get emotional connection. We get um, social connection. Uh, we then have a, a driving force for learning within and between young people. That means that you're dealing with a, a, a different force. It's not a lot of the way in which you think about how you need to incentivize learning through a whole set of other structures and arrangements and, and disciplines. Uh, I think if we are clear that the nature of the learning that we are wanting to, um, to initiate, uh, that we are wanting to enable, because we, as Stephanie said before, we've, in, we've, we've experienced it ourselves. We will then be designers of different learning environments using other adults to support our work, thinking differently about the use of time in school and out of time, thinking differently about online and face-to-face, -face, thinking differently about on campus for social and emotional learning, which is so critical to combine with cognitive development because without all three, you don't learn. Yeah. So it just strikes me that the fantastic thing about asking the question about time in order for us to be able to invest in our own professional learning demands a different way of thinking about the entire learning business. And that, that's why I think that the COVID-19 uh, uh, challenge has been uh, so encouraging of uh, innovation, yep, um, and recognition of what the teaching profession can and has been doing. So my sense is that there's a real force there that in a sense uh, overcomes what have been previous barriers. <laughs> in other words, uh, I think it's a bit like uh, Stephanie saying, if you can tap into that will and that will is shared, and this is the, the other point, it, th this has got to be shared by parents and it is being. It's got to be shared by superintendents and Stephanie called out in the chat that it is being, right? Mm -hmm. It's got to be sh shared by communities, yeah? Mm -hmm. By political leaders, yeah? So by legislators, so this is not just a game that we play within the education industry. All stakeholders have to appreciate that this work is the most important work. And if we don't tackle it, then down the stream, we'll be dealing with systemic racism and, and inequity of a kind that you will not be able to reverse because that's what we've experienced, yeah? So invest in this, be partners in this work, give us the conditions under which we can actually create this, legitimize this, and support it. I think we've got half a chance now of getting people in a position where all of the authorizers and legitimizers of our work might be coming together. They're clearer about what the task is. I think they need to, I think they realize that in fact, it's gonna take our collective will. And I think they realize we can't do it by ourselves. We've got to do it in partnership. We can't just build our own capacity to do this work. We have got to build the capacity of others to support us. And that includes uh, parents, of course, and community. But most importantly, the big force is young people. What an untapped force, right? We talk about student or learner agency or placing students at the center. Like that's where the real power lies. And if we can figure out ways of being able to seriously tap into that uh, and as a teaching profession, help to, to navigate 
manage, direct, right, and support that learning, uh, young people are going to transform uh, the way in which we go about our business because they will not be satisfied with how we do it now. And they've made it clear. I'm not saying that we got it right online. I'm not saying we haven't suffered learning loss. But I am saying that for many young people, they have experienced motivation for their learning of a different order. Now, we've got to be very careful about this because the OECD has got stats to say only around about 30% have really had the positive experience and 70, another, another 30, 40% have been marginal and another bunch of kids, right, a serious percentage have been lost through this pandemic. But I'm just arguing that we need to bring all of that together, I think, as we think about our standards and as we think about the design work, which is absolutely fundamental transformation. I've got two, this is great. I've got two more questions that I really wanna to get to um, with uh, the, the little bit of time that we have less, left. I think we have like three or four minutes left. Um, so whoever wants to answer either of these questions, go have at it. So one is, how will we work with teacher preparation programs to make sure that there's an understanding of the standards before teachers enter the classroom? So that's one. And the other one is really, we talk a lot about the tools for deep implementation and execution, not just adoption of the standards, but how you, so you know about the tools because you've been on the uh, standards uh, advisory committee that we have, are we missing any major tools that we haven't thought about um, in addition to the role, the, the, the guidance that we'll give by role specific um, um, implementation guides and the monitoring to make sure you're making progress and um, assessments. So please, and either of you can answer either both or one or the other of those two questions. Who wants to start? Um, Denise, I'll start with the university question because I work at a university and I work with teacher prep and leader prep. And uh, and when I was at the Department of Ed, I was uh, my job as was director. One of the things was program approval of higher education programs. And I think that's where we start. We start with state policy, and you know all our teacher preparation programs and leader preparation programs have to be approved by their state their Department of Education so that the educators earn their certification. Uh, their certificate to to teach or to be or to, to be a principal or superintendent all the different certifications and i think that's a place to start with a conversation about the importance that part of preparing a teacher is not not only the skills and knowledge they need on their content and their pedagogy but that they're part of that is their responsibility for their own professional learning and that is be a place where you know the you know learning forwards professional learning standards would be a great for a faculty member, a great opportunity for them to introduce them to those standards because I speak to a lot of seniors about, okay, what happens after I graduate and I get my first job? Well, you know, your learning doesn't stop there. You're going to be engaged in professional learning. You'll get advanced degrees. So I think there's many opportunities to start with the Department of Education, of course, and always, you know, there's a professional organization of deans uh, where we talk to them about starting early with these educators about that they're that it's lifelong learning and that they need to think about their professional learning from the time they leave the university as they go into their first position um, um, in the school so you know I think there's would be great interest in having that conversation both at both the Department of Ed and at universities with faculty and with deans thank you so I have three tools. I don't know if we can no. do this or not real quick. All right, want to hear them. Okay, yes. So I noticed Linda Davins in the participants today from NEA. And Tony talked a lot about, you know, teacher leadership, collaborative leadership. And I just wonder if there's an opportunity to collaborate with our teachers organizations around some sort of special toolkit agenda about how do teachers use and mobilize the standards to really make the dramatic changes that we wanna see in professional learning. So that's one idea. Another one is, this is, I guess it's dreaming, but you know, maybe it's time for a new change game. 
um, you know, CETL had the change game how many years ago to teach us about the stages of change and, and what districts go through. Maybe we need a transformation change game of some kind. And then the third one is, I just encourage you as you go back through future revisions of these standards, as you continue to iterate that, know that your cases, your examples that you're using are going to be set up as exemplars. And so people are going to read those and they're going to say, oh, this is what it looks like. And so just make sure that you are very thoughtful in how each one of those stories really reflect the kind of transformation that we've all advocated today. Denise, I'll just add two points. And that is um, in the tool category, I think we have got to remind ourselves that the work is deeply relational and we need to make sure we seriously exploit uh, feedback, coaching and mentoring. I know that's in the standards and I know that we're talking about it, but it just strikes me that there's a real, there's a human face to this that has got to be seriously invested in and we've never got the returns that you can get out of fantastic feedback and coaching. I reckon we should exploit more of it. The flip side is, for God's sake, we've got AI. Mm -hmm. Like, when are we going to seriously exploit, right, the technology that is already in our phones, our, our cell phones, right? Mm -hmm. Like, let's not talk about uh, too many tools that don't actually access what is already there for us and what is emerging every day, quite frankly, the faster I can get my personal robot, the better, right? <laughs> I wanna, I just wanna get into this space and use the AI and the technology in really powerful ways. And that's not just about the learning analytics, right? As ways mm -hmm. of being able to know how I'm learning, that's, that's absolutely fundamental, but it's actually much deeper, I think, about the way in which we then carry on all of our work. Yep. So I just love to feel that we could get into this territory with our own professional learning, and then we'll see how powerful it is for young people's learning. Thank you so much. And I apologize to my team. I think we're a couple of minutes over, but it has been so worth it. I thank you all so much for this in-depth discussion and for all that you've contributed. Um, as members of the Standards Advisory Council, and of course, just who you are and what you represent. So with that, Tracy, I'll turn it over to you to introduce to everyone uh, our new draft revised standards. Yes, and thank you so much for that conversation. Uh, I love uh, everywhere you went and thanks to the folks who added in the chat box, really appreciate it. Um, and so the, you know, thinking about transformation in all its meanings and what we strive to do, uh, we continue to invite uh, input on how we can be most useful in your efforts to do that. So uh, if you'd like to bring your face back into the room, we sh sure invite you to turn your cameras back on. We appreciate that. And we're going to share just a few more slides. I know that uh, when this Session ends in just over 15 minutes. I know you only have half an hour before your next learning forward session. So um, we're gonna share a couple slides and some links in the chat box um, so you can get a chance to look at the standards yourself. Uh, so we see in front of us uh, an illustration of the revised standards as they are now. Uh, when we look at 10 standards in three categories. And you see the um, conditions for success in blue there. And so that's really looking at um, the context in which learning happens and the conditions critical to its success. And so you see standards there, uh, leadership and resources. And those are familiar to you. Um, culture of collaborative inquiry and equity foundations. And you'll notice in revised standards for professional learning that there are explicit equity standards in each of the three categories of the system. Um, so that's the, the blue, the conditions uh, section of the system. Transformational process, which has been a focus in part of the conversation today 
that's where you see equity drivers. So uh, what, um, what are some of the considerations for how adults learn and how we ensure an equity of access and opportunity to adult learning? Um, so this is, uh, as Stephanie said, kind of the, the how of the learning, the learning designs, implementation, the ways in which we use evidence to uh, plan uh, learning, set goals, uh, monitor learning and, and uh, assess its impact. And then in the rigorous and inclusive content category, those are the, um, the what of adult learning. And you see reaching each student and curriculum assessment and instruction in that part of it. And as we look at that graphic, uh, we see the, the coherence here the, uh, and the ways that all the standards touch each other. Uh, in that, in the center, um, and how they're uh, working tightly together as a coherent system. So we'll just take a quick look at uh, the ten standards themselves on the next couple of slides. And so these are the the actual standards, the statements that say uh, what happens here. So uh, I mentioned the equity foundations, and so this is where we have educators. Uh, creating a vision for equitable access, creating structure and culture that uh, really attends to the development of, of every educator in the system. Culture of collaborative inquiry. And uh, this is a, the thread here connects to our current learning community standard. Uh, and the name change there is just understanding that learning communities has a variety of meanings to people um, at, at different levels of granularity in a system. And we really see this as a condition that uh, goes across all uh, professional learning, just to stressing the importance of not only collaborative learning, but a culture where educators take collective responsibility for each other and for all students. A leadership, uh, the importance of leaders uh, modeling learning, advocating for learning, uh, creating a compelling vision, making sure structures and resources are in place. And when we talk about leadership here, uh, we, move, we go beyond, as we always have, those who um, have formal leadership responsibilities or leadership titles, but really all the educators in a system who have responsibility for supporting learning for themselves and for others in the service of ensuring each child has access to high quality teaching and learning. And then resources, of course, time, money, people, um, technology, and the ways in which educators allocate resources, uh, look at, at equity through that resource lens as well, because that is a, is a key lever to equity. So in the transformation standards that we've been talking about, um, I mentioned the equity drivers standard, uh, making sure that educators have the, uh, the, the processes and the support to work uh, effectively with all their colleagues and to look at equity across all their learning processes. Uh, evidence and data remain critical to um, setting meaningful goals and, and monitoring learning along the way. Uh, and Stephanie talked about learning designs and implementation as we think about transformation. How do learning designs, um, how do we select, identify learning designs to meet the needs of the educators in the room and to match toward those learning goals that we set through the evidence that we examine? And implementation, how do we sustain learning over time and ensure that uh, educators have feedback, support, uh, and structures that make sure their learning is embedded and sustained. And then just a quick look at the two content standards. Curriculum assessment instruction. I mean, this is where we talk about uh, the importance of high quality instructional materials and what the learning looks like when educators spend their time collaboratively uh, understanding, unpacking those high quality instructional materials so that they can then um, really understand and tailor their instruction for the students in front of them. Um, and then reaching each student where educators recognize every student's particular assets uh, and their aspects of identity. They understand the context of their students and their families and communities. And so this is another critical uh, equity standard for us. 
So we'll just take a look at what each standard includes. We just have one sample here. Um, and Elizabeth, at any time, you could put the link to the, um, to the revised standards, but we've been talking about them a lot. If you didn't happen to catch the email the other day inviting your um, uh, look at them, the opportunity to download and the opportunity to go to that survey, uh, we'll make sure we have that link in the chat box. But you'll see for each of the standards, um, we have the statement of the standard itself. And I'll just note uh, that the graphic there refers almost like a little roadmap where you are in the system when you see that little blue, uh, it's almost like a card uh, that, you know, the cu culture of collaborative inquiries sitting within that foundations uh, aspect of the system. Uh, and then on the next page, you'll see that we, for each standard, provide um, a narrative uh, with uh, covering three key concepts in the standards. And this is very much like the 2011 standards where we uh, highlight three components of that uh, critical standard and talk about uh, what, what that means, what implications are for professional learning, as well as uh, resources and references. And then uh, in addition to standards and uh, is are several essential actions. So what is it that educators do? And this is sort of leading us toward uh, implementation. And this is not a comprehensive, comprehensive list. It's a selected list of uh, priority pieces of this. Uh, and these are written, uh, they are role agnostic here. So sort of at a higher level where what would it, any educator do as, as they work toward implementation of the standard? Uh, as we get into implementation guides by role, you'll see more and more specifics. Uh, and then finally, uh, there is a, a vignette uh, for each standard. And in addition to highlighting uh, what the standard looks like in a variety of learning contexts and a variety of content areas, um, this is where you also see, I think to a certain extent, the connections among standards. You can't write about one without writing about uh, all uh, because leadership is always an element, even if we're here talking about the culture of collaborative inquiry and the content of learning is always a part of it and examining uh, data and evidence is always part of it. So this is where you start to see what this looks like in, in practice. So that's what you see in each standard. And I know some of you have had a greater degree of familiarity with these at this point, And some of you are just getting all this information for the first time when you join us today. Um, but we do, we do wanna share, we wanted to have a, a little bit of an opportunity to kind of get your, your first reactions to what we've shared today about uh, draft revised standards. And so we have an opportunity to link out to a uh, Padlet. If you haven't used Padlet before, this is an app or a, um, an opportunity. It's kind of like a sticky wall. And um, Elizabeth, if you put that link in the chat box, and we're just asking you uh, three questions. Um, just what are you excited about? What are, you question, what are your questions? And what are your concerns at this point? Um, and I know you have much more to learn about it, but would just love your initial feedback as you hear what we're planning to do. Um, and so, you know, we're asking for feedback on so many levels here um, on this Padlet, sort of in the process of this session. Uh, we'll also ask for feedback on the session itself, as you've been doing in each of your sessions at the conference. And then as, uh, as you have time, the review period for this draft of standards is six weeks. And so um, that link to standards also includes a link to the SurveyMonkey uh, input form. And we know you may not have time to answer all those questions. Any level of feedback, we will just appreciate so much. So I see uh, many of you uh, going to the Padlet. Uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to use one of these before, you. Just hit the plus sign and it puts your sticky note on the wall. Um, and questions, uh, what you're excited about and love seeing all this. Um, and thank you to the person who noticed there's a crosswalk. That's something we've always included as we revise standard, just kind of showing connections, bridges between versions of standards and you know, however, whatever form these take as we 
revise and finalize them, we'll be sure to include a crosswalk. Um, so we have alignment over time as well. And appreciate very much your, your questions and concerns there. Um, and I will say, so I see a question. Is there a particular area or standard that you desire more feedback than another area? And so, you know, we, of course, we want feedback on all of them. Um, if, it, if you want to choose those that are um, perhaps you feel are closest to where you spend your time, uh, but also those that are perhaps newest to the system um, and the ways in which the, so the equity standards and the ways they will apply for you. Uh, we would also love uh, input on those and additional resources and references. All right, so thanks for taking a first look. We really appreciate that. And I think Paul's gonna give a sense of our timeline. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. And again, thank you for your comments and questions as some of those also note um, about the timeline and also about the bigger intent, which is we uh, believe it's very important to continue to move from adoption of standards to deeper implementation and ownership. And I think our panel members did a incredible job of making that point and driving that home. And that's also really where we're heading with the implementation tools um, that we'll talk about and show you here for this, again, this intentionality of moving from having state policy leaders and others move from implementation to uh, or move from adoption to a stronger level and deeper level of implementation. So as you know, they have been released, the first draft, uh, this revised draft, and it will go till January 15th. And that's when, thank you, Elizabeth, for putting that in the chat for both the draft standards and the, the survey. And that's an opportunity to really give holistic feedback um, across all of the standards through a set of guiding questions. So we also ask you to share that link as widely as you can um, with your colleagues so that there are opportunities. Uh, I mean, I know even Jackie mentioned like it would be great even on the university side, the prep side to have that as a way to build awareness and also feedback. Um, and then as you see in 2021, there's a, a, a really a, a strong thrust and movement toward developing the implementation tools and love Stephanie's idea of working collaboratively, maybe with NEA and others for developing tools at the teacher side um, to really drive ownership around the standards. Uh, we'll have a target date of late spring for a, a revised draft, kind of a 2.0, along with some of the tools that we're gonna be asking districts to test out and to give feedback on aligned with members of the Standards Advisory Council and those work teams. So that's going to be another great feedback loop to really help to drive the development of the tools in, in the implementation tool phase around in 2021. And then we'll continue that through the remainder of the year so that the goal is by early 2020, 20, 2022, which is not that far away actually, uh, is the final release of both the final standards and the set of tools and that suite of tools by design would accompany uh, both. So that's really the roadmap we're on and we can't do that without all of you. And that's why your feedback is so critical. Um, and again, for today being part of this as well as ongoing opportunities to provide feedback is great. Uh, and I think we do have the link just as kind of on a final slide here uh, again for uh, just, yeah, that, you, that this is the one Elizabeth put in the chat um, for that. So again, um, I know we're so excited about the, these labs and running those. And so I'm going to turn it back to Denise, I think for our final thoughts as we close out for today's standards lab. Thank you, Paul. And I can't thank uh, our panel enough for this engaging and, um, tremendously broad and comprehensive conversation that we've had on transformation, uh, couldn't have asked for more. And thank you so much. And thank you for all the participants um, here for, for selecting this session. And we do look forward to hearing, as everyone has said, hearing from you is so important. And um, we, we thank you and you'll continue to hear more and more. As we said, we're iterating all the time and you will be hearing uh, more from us on the standards for sure. So thank you all. And I tell you, Tony and Stephanie and Leilani and Jackie, thank you. Let's all give a round for everyone. You were just phenomenal. Thank you so much.
just a quick final note too. There's the session evaluation in the chat. And so you'll need the uh, session ID number, which is 2211. And then we strongly encourage you to, if you could fill that out about this particular session would be great um, for that link. So again, thanks to everyone and hope you have a great rest of the conference this afternoon. Bye. Bye everyone.